Let me ask uh, Mark Wallet to uh, introduce this conversation. Mark? Sure. Right. Well, QRX Partners is and our partners, and we partner with companies to uh, for their quality and regulatory. And we don't have uh, off the shelf solutions. And we, when we get done, you will operate your system and we help you go fast. And that's, that's our central theme. Who writes and, your marketing copy, Mark? Um, we're working on it. He's, he's, he's adapting some of the things that I've written. <laughs> um, you know, a, a big part of this is understanding, you know, all of these, uh, the requirements, the regulations, the standards, um, as, as many of you may know, I'm a, I'm an active participant in ISO TC 210, uh, and particularly working group one, although I've been part of joint working group one for risk management. I'm also part of IC, ISO TC 262, which is the designated risk management technical committee. Um, so ISO 31,000 belongs to 262. Um, so because I've been there for a lot of the discussions and the writing of the standards and the, the guidance documents, um, there was an IWA that risk management did as well um, that I can mention. But um, because I've been there, it helps, I think, a lot on, uh, to be able to understand the pieces behind it. And when Mark says that we can help organizations go fast, it's because we know the the regulations, the requirements so well that we're able to help people navigate that. So instead of running straight forward into a wall, we, we'll help you avoid the walls. And so that's what a, a lot of what we're doing to be able to help people understand the the, the intent and pieces behind the standards, the regulations, um, so that they, they don't run into troubles. So, And this is where we dovetail into a conversation about risk. Sure. So, I mean, and, and I'll just kind of intro it. Um, you know, the application of risk, risk and risk management has become a big thing. Um, between ISO 13485, the quality management system standard, and the implementation of the risk-based approach, um, and then the advancement of 14971, the main medical device risk management standard. Um, I, I think we've uh, come some distance in the last few years on discussing risk and the understanding of risk. Um, and so I just wanna, you know, as I intro it and often talk, have been talking separate things. So ISO 13485 outlines in 7.3, uh, one, I think 7.3, that the one or more processes necessary for risk management. And that's in product realization. So there's a, there's a piece that's product realization or product risk that really 14971 is aimed at. Um, it has all of the things about identifying harms and hazards that lead to, uh, hazards that lead to harm, the severity of that harm, the probability of occurrence of that harm. And then of course, determining the acceptability of risk. Um, and, and I'll propose to you, um, despite the, just saying that there's an acceptability of risk, you can't look at a risk and accept it on it just by looking at a risk. You have to be able to compare it to something. And so this is where that benefit risk comes in. And so we will generally say you always are going to require some sort of a benefit risk analysis to determine the acceptability of risk. Um, and that's all in the product risk management. And then there's, of course, the follow-up that um, risk management doesn't stop with design and development. It goes throughout the product life cycle. So you have post-market surveillance and, uh, and the follow-up to that you know, risk discussion. And that's all the product risk piece. Okay. Um, and so we can come back to that in a little bit as we can have questions, because then I want to go into the other side of this, which is the risk-based approach that's outlined within 1345. If you're a 9001 fan, you have a have risk-based thinking in there. Um, and risk-based thinking and, and the risk-based approach was meant to be integrated into the process approach, which is the, you know, the normal PDCA cycle for improvement of processes. And so as you look at that, um, where you do the, the, the do part of that cycle, is where you're taking some sort of actions or mitigations or applying controls to the processes. You're, you're making some sort of a change in that do aspect of it. Um, and so that's where we're asking you to do the risk-based approach in, in applying those controls. The basic reason though, comes down to, we were we, we understand the, the problems that come in when you apply what's what you might call the arbitrary approach. 
or this is the way we did it at my last job, or this is the way we did it at my last company, or those types of things, those types of answers of how you do your processes. Um, rather, the risk-based approach gives you some criteria to decide how you should do that for your organization. I'll say that it, it allows you to right-size it to your own organization. And I'll give you some examples, You can because you can give examples in every quality management system process. Um, you can use it in doc control. Um, you have an, you might have a small organization that's just using paper, right? And and that um, as you start to grow, and that paper is located in one place, and now you have multiple offices, multiple places. You're trying to work, you know, remotely and that kind of stuff. All of a sudden, having a piece of paper to, that you have to go look at is not very convenient, right? And so, a control you might put into place is to to have an electronic document control system or you know, scanning things or be able to make things available electronically. Well, then all of a sudden you, you run into the problems where if it's a if it's a PDF that was just scanned, if I didn't OCR it or recognize the characters, I can't actually search that, right? It's still just a, a, a picture. And so then, then comes along the medical device regulation that says your technical documentation has to be searchable. <laughs> and so now we have to, another piece of risk we have to mitigate by using OCR. So you can kind of understand how these controls can kind of, you know, continue to look for the next improvements. Okay. And, and again, we can do this in, in every process, every uh, uh, quality management system process, there's a way to apply some controls um, that right size it to your organization. When you typically uh, take on a client, Mark, what what are their overarching issues? Like, what do you see that say, okay, this is this is where we need to tighten things up? Well, I I think there's kind of two sides of that coin. Um, so the the first thing most people when they ask about quality management systems, they'll ask, well, can't you just give me a template, or don't you just have a a way you do it? And and most of the time we have to say, no, we want to understand your organization. How many people are in your organization? Where are you working in one office? All that kind of stuff. So that we can, again, right-size it to you. Um, and so I think that's one of the things or one of the false things that happens in, is that we talk about risk, uh, risk-based risk approach is that people want to, they, they think that it's always the same for everybody. And you can quickly find out that it's not. And that's what the risk-based approach helps you do. Um, the, the second part of that, you know, where do you run into problems? Um, we run into problems again because people are so used to, well, I'll just take this from my last job. I was at Medtronic. Medtronic has a good system. So I'm just going to take their, their system for document control and records control. Yeah, but Medtronic has the resources to buy Agile PL PLM and, you know, all of these systems and all that kind of stuff. And they have the, you know, five people in doc control and I have a half of a person. So I can't handle all of that burden. Right. And so we have to understand that from that risk based approach. What's applicable to our company? It's, it, you know, I can't just take something from somewhere else. And that's what we most often run into is they, you know, just give me what Medtronic has. And I'm like, no, no, no. You don't, I spent 12 years there. You don't want that burden. <laughs> so those types of things. So does that, does that make sense, Joe? Okay. What other questions are there? How else can I help people understand this risk? concept. I mean, I, I know that it's, it's, it's a concept that lots of people, I'll say, get confused about. It, it's a, it's, it's sometimes hard to understand. Um, and you try to, I, I try to bring it back to some basic terms. Um, I just mentioned earlier, because I mentioned earlier about you can't just look at a risk and decide that it's acceptable or not. So I live in Minnesota, I'm not sure where everybody else is. But, you know, we're coming to that time of year where that white stuff is floating through the air. Um, and so often I'll give people an example so they can understand how this risk things has to happen. Um, if I look out the window and there's six inches of snow on the ground, the snow is still falling. And I don't have any cucumbers in the refrigerator. I'm going to look out the window and say, yeah, I don't really need to go to this store right now. Um, that seems like it's, you know, too much risk. Um and I'm still sitting there and my daughter calls and says she needs to be picked up from school. I don't even think about that. I'm out the door before it, it even happens. So you can see how something that was a significant risk that I wasn't going to take all of a sudden became a no brainer because of the benefit side of that. Um, so it has to be compared, compared to something. 
Um, you can't just look at a risk and say that's acceptable or not, generally. It's an interesting uh, analogy. Uh, Luke, I know that uh, you had your hand raised. You had a question or a comment? Uh, just a moment. <clears throat> Yes, my, my problem with risk is not identifying a risk, but it's quantifying it. Say, it's almost a guess on uh, occurrence or on severity. Maybe severity is not the hardest part, but the occurrence is. Yeah. So is it once every month, every year, every lifetime, every one million years? And it's just a guess normally. And the problem you get when it's guessed wrong is when the somebody with a, a high safety standard says, no, it happens a lot, or, and then uh, you get to mitigate that risk. And then you get into the problems, how to technically mitigate that risk. So identifying risk is not that hard. Uh, the identifying the benefits is uh, also not hard, but then quantifying the benefits is hard. So what 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 comment do you have on yeah, that? Yeah, for sure, for sure, quantifying the benefits is is probably uh, a little bit difficult. But but this is the thing, I will submit to you that if you are trying to calculate an occurrence, you will always do it wrong, always. And and I don't say always a lot, but there's a lot of evidence that says that complaints are you know, if you're using your complaint rate or the, the reported issues rate or something like that. There's a lot of information that says that complaints are underreported. I mean, just think about this from a human standpoint. If I'm a clinician and I have a problem with a product and it causes a problem with the patient, how many people do you want to tell that to? Really? I mean, we expect that they're going to re report those complaints. And you ask any clinician and they're going to say, no, it was easier to just throw it away <laughs> and be done with it. So I will tell you that you're going to get, I mean, and this comes across the industry a lot. Complaints are underreported by as much as 80% is what the normal feel is. Well, if that's the case, and that's what you're using to, to understand risk, you are underestimating the risk consistently, always. So don't, I, I would submit to you that you have a better way to do that. Um, what the- Well, is that 80% number something that you work with as an as an assumption, I'd never heard that number before. Mark. Yeah, that's that's come across from whether you talk to FDA or talk to other people within the industry. Um, it's pretty routinely talked about that complaints are underestimated by around 80%. Ms. Gates? We, we've I... heard the same thing uh, as we talked to various, you know, about what the data is and where it's coming from. It's grossly underreported. Yeah, we, we always found that, especially when I was in CPG, um, consumer goods, it's Every one complaint, we figured there's 10 to 20 people that just didn't bother. Hmm. You leave that. Oh, so, I mean, you're 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 talking about numbers that are even higher than 80% then. Oh, yeah. In the foods, yeah. So we always sent out free gifts and made them happy and it helped with other things. So, but with medical, medical device, device medical device manufacturers will do the same thing. They'll replace product for free. No problem. I, I love everything you're saying is what happens in packaging. I do packaging and people just think it happens and without understanding the risk, without understanding quantities. And it's very frustrating working with them. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I will tell you, because a lot of people, a lot of organizations that I've worked with, if you go sit with the clinicians and ask them about an issue, they will tell you that something that happens at a 10% rate is a low occurrence. If you look at the at the rating scales on every company that I've ever been with, 10% is way beyond the highest number on the scale. And so we've got a we've got a mismatch between what engineers think and what clinicians think in how we do these these ratings. And so I will tell you that the this is the reason in 14971 they allow and, and it's completely on par with quantitative analysis, the qualitative analysis of the experts. It's the reason we tell you, you your risk management team has to include the people across the spectrum. It can't just be the engineers. It has to be the clinicians, The if you can get customers to be part of it, all of that, that your risk management team should include all of that. Okay. And so because of that, so you can get, a, the, the reason is to get a better estimate. Now, in the end, when it comes down to this, and I think you kind of hit it on the head, if you end up in those higher areas where 
your your process may indicate that you need to do some sort of risk reduction, right? Put some controls into place. Then that's what you need to do. And you apply all of the controls that you can technically apply. And when you get to the end of that, you you will always, always, again, have some remaining risk. And that has to be assessed against the, the benefit, the clinical benefit, whatever the, the, the benefit is, right? Of whether or not it's, it's worth it. I have a funny question, which is a little bit different. How did your risk people get the Haas group reviewing all the uh, ISO documents for the European stuff to um, make sure everybody includes risk assessments in their documents now? And it's holding up documents for years, but I don't understand how you guys trained them to do that. <laughs> well, yeah, and then, uh, well, I, I mean, the European regulations now and, and the requirements for the risk analysis, the risk management piece, um, you know, and the adoption of the EN version of the standard um, in 2020 um, as, as, a, as a harmonized standard, um, I, I think it, it, it comes to a practicality of, um, in the end, you should only release a product that has an acceptable risk, you know, and, and, and it's, you know, that. Again, you can the term safe, right? That 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 other four letter word of safe means it's free from unacceptable risks. It's not freedom from risk, it's freedom from unacceptable risk. Right. And so that's why I say you have to come to that decision of acceptability. Um I worked in heart valves for years. Having your heart stopped on an operating table to get a valve replaced yeah, is that's a, bad, right? It's a pretty risky procedure. Mm -hmm. But the flip side of that is if you don't get the valve replaced, you're going to die earlier. So are you going to take that risk? And is the benefit of that outweigh that risk? It does. So I'll take it. And that's what you always, again, you're always making that assessment. It's the reason that we, the regulations require the disclosure of, in, in the way we wrote it in the standard, the significant residual risks. Right, because they you have to allow people to make that choice. There are some people that are gonna take that risk and some people that'll say, you know what, I don't need the surgery. You know, um, whether you talk about knee replacements, hip replacements, you know, heart valve replacements, is there another way to do it? You know, catheter-based therapies in valve replacements now are are coming up. So I mean, there's there's these other things that have you know lower risks associated with them. Um, I'll tell you guys, you know, um, I had a hernia surgery a couple years ago and most hernia surgeries are done by robotics now, but they're done through, you know, little slits. Right. Um, honestly, I told them cut me open uh, when I had my, when I had my surgery. Why? Because then I know he can visualize all the nerves, all the tendons, all that kind of stuff. He can, the, the surgeon can see that stuff and there's no mistakes going to happen where a robot nicks a, something and then something doesn't work. So I, I made a, a choice on based on risk. So, Mark, I'd like to um, I'd like to give you the opportunity to take an excerpt from today's conversation and use it when you're talking with your prospects. I rarely go down this road, but I I'm enjoying this conversation. I, sure. I'm thinking that um, someone who sees this on the channel and tunes in later won't know like what am I supposed to do with this? Like, yeah, I agree with everything this guy is saying, but how might you frame it so that it were like an if then, like if condition, um, I will just say we should talk as it's very lame, but you know, if this, these are the things you need to be thinking about. If this, these are the things that I would recommend that you do. And, you know, when I do um, a webinar, uh, I typically conclude with something like, at this point, you have three choices. Number one is you can say thank you and ignore everything I've said. Yeah. Number two, you can say, thank you for the free ideas and go do everything yourself. Or number three, you can hire an expert to execute them for you. Yeah. Um, so I would ask you to try number two. Give us free stuff that we're not going to hire you guys. You're too expensive. You're too this. I know somebody, whatever. What do I need to, to be doing? What am I not educated enough about that I wouldn't have even said, I wouldn't even understood that if part? Yeah. 
you you make that a little bit tough to, you know and just i mean because i'm thinking of so many things that um i mean i, I think it would if be, i was going to give if i was going to just give one piece of advice to to people is never come to the risk management and, and start the risk management discussion early do not come to the risk management discussion with your end in mind what i mean by that is most people come to the risk management discussion trying to figure out how they can come to a conclusion that they don't need to do anything. Mm -hmm. And that's a mistake. Um, what they really need to come to it is, to, uh, and, and this is where other people get stuck in, in, in things, risk management is really preventive action. It's actions you're taking to prevent occurrence of something, right? And so if you can go to the preventive action clause 8.3 and 1345 and look at that, that's risk management, okay? Um, and so I would come to this thinking how, you know, it, it, in the way we would often think about it, and uh, many people in med device think about it this way. If I was going to have this product used on my mother, my daughter, my my wife, myself, what are the things that I'm thinking about that I want to reduce the risk on, right? I just told you about a surgery that I had Um and, and most think people think that robotics are the most advanced things. And so I should go with the robotic approach. Well, there's risks there that I, that you might not want to take <laughs> and you just got to, you know, and, and disclose those and think about them and reduce those as far as possible. If it was possible to completely visualize all of the tissue and everything, of course, robotics would be the, the, the most safe way to do it, but that's not the way it is today. So, I mean, all of these things are, are the things that we have to think about. And then I'll bring you back to the next reason that we, you know, you can't stop doing risk management is uh, there's a phrase within the medical device regulation in Europe, a uh, forward phrase, state of the art. Okay. And so you know a thing or two about the state of the art, don't you? you know, the state of the art keeps moving forward. And so because of that, the risk modeling changes. And so that's why we have to keep revisiting it. So you have to be prepared to do that throughout your product life cycle is understanding the state of the art may change. In medical terms, it's the standard of care, right? When the standard of care changes, we need to make sure that the risk of our products are still good. So pre-amendment products may not be the, the best things to look at. Well, okay. I, I don't know that I necessarily agree that um, state of the art and standard of care are the same things. I feel like it's a life cycle in yeah. where one begets the other. And so if you start at at what standard of care may be, the actual medical device community and the standards that define state of the art aren't there or are not updated enough yet to reflect standard of care. Yeah. Because one one's a, a leader and one's a follower. Yeah. I'm just trying to give it, you know, kind of terminology of you know how we might relate to each other. Um, again, as you talk about clinicians and the difference between clinicians and engineers. Um, clinicians understand the state of the or the, the standard of care terminology. Um, engineers tend to understand the state of the art. The engineers will probably always be behind where, where the standard of care is. Um, but I, just again, trying to get some similar terminology. I think that's one of the things, again, we have to, if you get something to take away, the reason that you engage experts is because they have a wider level of experience than you would have. You always want to get the best information you can get, the best estimates, the you know, and, and, and engage the key opinion leaders, the people that are leading the discussions on standard of care and that kind of stuff so that you understand how to apply that to your product. Mark, the example you gave before about your hernia, I, I hope you are fully recovered. I am, thanks. Good. Um, you said, well, you present this, you know, case where Mr. Swanston, we have a robotic and you, are evaluating whether or not you like the risk. And that seems so terribly subjective that I'm left with, you know, how do we quantify risk? Because there's a reason we, the hospital system, the physician have chosen to go with the robotic solution. And presumably we as your providers know more than you as a patient. And yet you're going to say, yeah, I don't like the risk here. Let's go with the other thing. It just... I'm well, using Joe, this, I'm, I'm having, I'm having a, can, if I may. Oh. <laughs> I'm using this as a, an analogy mm -hmm. for 
you saying, you know, please don't come to the party and say, I already know the answer. Can you justify it? I don't want to do anything. Right. Um, because the parallel is like you, you've already concluded that, you know, ro robots could nick my tissue. I've already concluded that under most reasonable conditions under the curve, I've mitigated risk reasonably. So to just say, ask an expert, you know, you know, the expression, everybody has a, you know, everybody has an opinion. Well, that wasn't the word I was going with. Um, but I, I cleaned it up for you. <laughs> yes, you did. And Andre Domino knows what I'm talking about. There's a way to say it in Italian that won't be so offensive, I imagine. <laughs> what were you going to say? I think it was, was it James? It's, it's yeah, probably, it's probably so, Italian, too. Yeah. Yeah, Ross? no, I was just saying, I'm going to have a procedure next week in the hospital. And I sat there with the doctor and I understood what he was saying. I knew what he was talking about, but I said, tell me your brand names of these devices you're using, because I know personally the people that are doing the packaging and I don't want infections. Yeah. <laughs> so, and that's a specific thing that you could talk about is a hole in a sterile barrier, because depending upon the type of device you're getting, an infection might not show up for years or it might show up immediately. So we have to make sure when we are doing our packaging tests that we know what happens. So a lot of people will just do shock of vibration aging or something and get a hole and say, oh, we've got to repackage or do something. Well, I've had instances where I've gone back, looked at the hole, and because I have experience, I knew it didn't happen during my testing. It happened on the production line. And they hadn't looked at the various risks that were going to cause holes in a sterile barrier. So you, you've got to look at that and, and understand the risks all the way through the life cycle of that product. And that might even go to some of the tools that we use. So traditionally, the, the most common tool is an, what's called an FMEA or failure modes effects analysis. Um, that's an okay tool, but it's really bad at seeing a sequence of events. You know, it can only see really limited scope or a limited area, that kind of stuff. Now, we make some modifications or adjustments because we'll do it at various steps. You know, we get, might do it at, at various process steps in a process of FMA. We'll repeat some of the same same things and that kind of stuff. But be that as it may, this is why I, I'm kind of coming to you, Joe, saying that it really has to be the expert people that understand the process, that can see those things uh, and that kind of stuff. And it takes people with a lot of experience to be able to take all of that in. Now you're saying, I, I get what you're saying too, is I'm going to believe the doc because he's the expert. I would say that's probably not the best course of action. If it's, you're it's, having a, you're almost, you're almost contradicting yourself. You said, go ask an expert. Yeah. Then you say, I, I say the doctor's an expert and you'd be like, yeah, I don't know about him being the expert. I mean, but, well, so this is the, this is the conversation. Let's go back to the, the conversation. If I may, I, if I may. I'm going to call on the typically shy and silent Mark Willette to address what I just said. <laughs> well, one of the basic problems in risk management is that we all drove to the airport, but we got on the plane and the greatest risk was all the way on the, on the, um, on the car know. ride to the airport, but we didn't calculate that. And, and your uh, doctor, your provider, he drives the car every day. Yeah. And he also does the surgeries every day. And he doesn't see those risks. We are, as humans, not capable yeah. of making those analyses. You're not capable, not me. <laughs> that's right. Well, that's that's but, the point. <laughs> yeah, but, so let me go back to that discussion because it wasn't me making the choice. It wasn't me finding all the risk. I mean, I actually sat down with the doc and I said, okay, doc, we're going to have this, this mesh surgery. You're going to put this mesh in me. Um, and, and how are you going to do that? He said, well, I have two methods I can use. I could either just, you know, make an incision and you know, move the things around, put the mesh in, you know, and, and fully visualize, or I can do it robotically. Um, and I said, okay, so what's the deal with the robotics? And he said, well, they're just two two tiny little slits then, and I can go in and um, you know, and, and put the mesh in place. I said, what's the problem with that? He said, well, it's a little bit hard to visualize all the things. 
And, you know, sometimes we could nick something or that kind of stuff. I was like, okay. I, now I understand the rest. I said, what about with the, um, with you just cutting me open and, and being, able, being able to do that? Well, you have a little bit longer scar. <laughs> really? So I can have a scar and you can, and you can fully see everything. And you're not telling me that there's any additional risks there, or I can have little tiny slits and you're telling me that there's problems seeing some things sometimes. I think I'll take the wide open one. Because who I else, who that else is going to see great, down there except for me? <laughs> I think that that's also a great example about the differences between state of the art, standard of care, and then where is technology going? And then how do you bring those three pieces together, not only in your design, but in fitting into the existing regulations? Or are you going to push the boundaries of existing regulations and knowing that you're going to do so? Um, and then... Um, technology technology is going to be the leader of, of both standard of care and then state of the art and and the other piece of that because i think it goes to what joe asked when when you're when if i had to give some advice to somebody if they're doing risk management is get somebody to facilitate that risk management discussion that asks questions and then have the experts there to answer the questions so don't just expect people to you know brainstorm and and put all the stuff out but have somebody facilitate that so that they can ask those questions like I did of the doc, right? I was asking him some questions to explain some things to me. And if I hadn't done that, people. I couldn't make the decision. Yeah. 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 You so need train people, people sure. for that. Yeah. I don't see a disconnect uh, like you described, Joel, because the, it's, it's nuanced. We all have different parameters that we prioritize when we assess risk. And so if you're assessing risk and Mark's saying, bring in the experts so you can talk about the risk, you want to ask them about the risks and characterize it. And the company might decide, yeah, we're going to go to the left or to the right because those are what parameters are important to us. Same with the doctor. The doctor is the expert and there is a standard of care. And this is a standard of care. But that standard of care is defined based on many factors, not just risk, but cost and time and outcomes and, uh, and, and cosmetic scars and all these other things. And so a standard of care is defined looking at many things. But Mark goes in and says, yeah, all that's nice. But there's this one dimension, the, the risk of nicking a nerve, that is dominant for me. So I'm going to not worry about the cosmetics and the time and the cost and, and go on that side. So in both cases, you've got experts. And in both cases, those experts are advising on the different risk parameters so yep. that the owner, whether it's the company or the patient, can make a decision. I'd like to call on Andre, um, who is the manufacturer, among us, a contract manufacturer. Mark, if you don't know him, how do you, how is risk presented to you by your clients? How do you manage it? And should I think of risk the same way when I'm speaking about the process of making the thing? I mean, there's, there's always a risk assessment that we're provided uh, that has been done previously. Uh, we've we've been asked at times to comment on the risk analysis. And, you know, we have our IMIVP of regulatory and then our chief science officer. And, you know, we look at it as a team to determine if all the risks have been considered in a medical device, both from, you know, from the manufacturing side, the, uh, the if a failure should occur, and on the user side. So it, it's, you know, it's a process that we go through on a regular basis. Brady is going to be our featured guest in two weeks. We're taking off, of course, for Thanksgiving. Um, how about, can I ask, Joe, if I can ask him, how often, so when we do, most of the time when we do risk analysis, right, or risk management, we're associating it to the harm of a patient or user. You as a contract manufacturer, do you get that same picture or, or do you get, left out of that picture a little bit no we are we are i mean we we ask about that we ask about the user experience uh and whether or not there's anything we need to know on the on the user side as well so i mean that's just something part of our own sop internally before we take on a project i think that's great because often that's one of the things i see is that if it's not you know like the company that's the legal manufacturer they're engaging a contract manufacturing firm often they don't give them the use perspective you know, how's this affecting the user? And that's so important to make sure that it happens. I think that's important, Andre. I think that's a great thing to have in your process. Yeah, well, Mark, just to let you know, we we, we also design and do, you know, design history files and so forth. So sure. we're very sensitive to that. And so that's where it's kind of part of our whole process. That's excellent. That's, that's a key thing to pick up. Make sure that people understand, you know, that he's doing things the right way. <laughs> I began uh, talking about uh, Brady, not only because... Uh, People just love the guy, uh, but because he's going to talk to us about um, how to get your product adopted. And I wonder 
Brady, if you take yourself off mute, does risk enter that conversation? Absolutely. And one of the one of the issues that I'm thinking about listening to, to Mark and a little closer to the mic, please. Sorry. <clears throat> Uh, I say absolutely, and listening to Mark and Mark discuss this, uh, one of the issues for me is that other people have different assessments of risk because, for example, the surgeon may be under, uh, you know, contract with his employer about complications that's, that affects how the surgeon's going to assess risk. And preview for next week when you, or week after, when you're talking about the risk that a prospect uh, uh, how the prospect assesses risk, you have to look at it the way they do, not the way you do, right? Like, like what I do for, for clients, I look as a, as a completely risk-free uh, transaction or risk-free service, but they don't view it that way. They see some risk. So I have to adopt that mindset and address their concerns. Um, you know, I'm with Mark. I'd rather be cut open and, and know that my hernia was visible and you know, because I'm not I'm not concerned about a scar. I'm not trying. I'm not out showing off my six pack. Um, <laughs> and, I, and I do have one under here somewhere. Uh, but yeah, I'm not out showing oh, off good. my six pack to people. So I don't care if there's a scar there. Yeah. Um, but that's but that's that's a personal assessment that my physician might not share. My six pack is in the fridge. <laughs> Hi, thanks for joining us. You have a, something to add? Yeah, I just um, I think it's a really nuanced and interesting conversation because. Um, what, what Mark was saying and what Grady was kind of saying is, is, you know, good risk management really starts with good usability and understanding use case. And even with the, the conversation that we started with, with the surgeon talking about the robots and you have this increased risk where there's, there's lots of actual information and studies about there that the age of your doctor matters because younger doctors are more experienced because they grew up with technology and games and yeah. everything like that. And so they can visualize 2D robotics much better than surgeons that were trained, you know, using old school technologies. And so when you're doing your risk assessment and your usability, the conversation that Mark has with his doctor might be different than the conversation I have with my best friend's husband, you know, because he, he might be a younger doctor or more familiar with that kind of style or trained better in his medical training to use robotics because they were available versus a doctor who, you know, they weren't available in their initial education. And so how do you manage the risk of the user and the user competency in your risk management program is really important in how you train physicians anytime that you're doing, you know, a complicated or new standard of care technology that's getting adopted. Mm -hmm. But this goes again to, and some of the stuff that we're talking about, I mean, people have these scales, right? One to five scale, one to 10 scale, one to three scale, mm -hmm. you know, and you, you know, low, medium, high risk, all those types of things. Um, I will tell you, it does not matter where you end up. Low, medium, high doesn't matter. You're still going to end up comparing it to the benefit. So why do you care what the, the number is? If, you're, if your team is sitting there arguing about numbers, every single time, I'll tell you, take the highest number that anybody says and move on. And then you can make a determination of what you can do to mitigate that risk and then compare it to the benefit and say whether or not it's acceptable. It does not matter where you are in the scale. Not one bit. Bill, I'd like to call on you too because your entire product concept is about risk mitigation for a patient. Um, what kinds of conversations do you as a uh, an entrepreneur have? Uh, do you have someone like uh, QRX that you consult with? How do you have decisions about risk? Uh, if you wouldn't mind for Mark's benefit, tell him what you do. So um, CarTech is a medical device company that I founded to solve a problem with filtering ampule-based medication. So we invented an all-in-one package one needle filter that has sure. enough filter and an inner cover. And actually this is very, um, very timely for me because we're trying to get in before December 17th for our first FDA submission, but it doesn't look like it's gonna happen because of all this risk. Um, we're waiting on the bio burden testing and we're also, um, some of the tests that we've, we've performed for the, the filter, we, we actually spent two years refining a filter that works better than both the two leading competitors. And in our final analysis, we found out that, that um, our filter does not 
the same company that performed the test a year ago performed the test again, but in a different way. And now there, it, it didn't come out as we planned, um, but they're, they did not perform it the same way. And, and these are unexpected tests, but we, and it turns out it's micro bubbles. So they weren't even testing particles, they were testing micro bubbles because they didn't perform it the same way. Yep. And we're talking to users and, and it, it basically mitigates the risk for needle stick injuries because you can just take the solution off and lure lock it into a line if you're a, a, a nurse or, or doctor and or else you can remove the outer filter and inject. Um, so that needle exchange, I think almost 50% of all needle stick injuries occurred during that needle exchange. So our our philosophy and our value proposition is that it mitigates the risk for both the patient and the healthcare worker. And it also saves time in an emergency situation, which we can quantify. But the risk in getting it to market, you know, I, I'm, my, my, um, my mantra this year has been patience and it looks like it's gonna be patience for next year because now we can't submit till February because the BD is is having a new ISO standard that won't be ready till February. But we want to make sure everything is perfect before we get a market and before we put it in front of FDA. Yeah. I, Thank you for that. And there's a lot of ISO standards and IC standards that that turn on risk, right? So we we mentioned usability 62366-1 um, is a direct integration of risk. 62304, which is software, um, also does that. And the biocompatibility standards all rely on the risk management. Um, a piece that you're talking about is um, test method validations. Um, in other words, that, that the tests are working in the way that they're supposed to work. And this is one of the programs that FDA has now started with the ASCA program, so the certification of test labs. Um, and so look for, you know, that that's one of the things FDA sees a risk in all of these tests happening. And they want to, so they're, they're trying to standardize or certify the labs and to, one to of the mitigate labs, that risk. Yeah, one of the labs that we were using out of um, uh, Steritech that they were using just got shut, shut down or they were audited. So now we have to start the process all over again with another lab. And we were like halfway through the whole process. Yes. So it's just um, mitigating. Well, this risk-based stuff is throughout the industry. It's not just happening when we talk about individual products. But when you're talking about testing, when you're talking about the, you know, what's necessary to make your regulatory submission, um, that's what we assess, you know, and, and when we, we say, because we'll go to the regulatory, you know, whether you're going to do a pre-submission or those types of things, how do you mitigate risk through pre-submission um, and these other interfaces with the agency? Um, the agency is actually getting much better at more informal communications. And so these are the things that we start interfacing with to mitigate that risk of regulatory submissions. Um, getting to know people at the agency, um, all of that type of stuff is in your favor to, you know, make sure that you can get your regulatory done, submission reviewed and done in a, in a timely manner. So that's what I'm that helps. I mean, these are the things that we help all of our clients with. And Joe, you asked me about, you know, those types of things before. I don't just look at product risk. We talked about risk management in 14971. That's just, that's a piece that can be done. Mm -hmm. But everything that we're doing we look at what's the risk of that. When I make a regulatory submission, a pre-submission, what's the risk that the, that the FDA is going to look at that in a bad light? You know, what what are what are we going to say to them that's that's going to reduce that risk? That they're going to look at us in a good, you know, that we're cooperating, that we're doing all the things that they're asking us to do, all of those types of things. Um, we have on on our on our website, we have what we call our inadequate response series. Um, which is what we every week we go look at the FDA warning letters and say these are the bad guys, right? And and what we're trying to do with that is to give people examples of what not to do because we would suggest that in, in in every time that I've dealt with the agency with any of the regulators in Europe or anywhere else, if you cooperate with them and you know help because they're on really on our side, they want to make sure that patients get helped. They just want to make sure that it's safe and effective. So every time that we cooperate with them, they're on our side. It's when you start arguing with them and saying that the risk is acceptable and and you're wrong that that we get in trouble. So mitigate Russell, the risk by cooperating, following standards, all those types of things. We'll conclude with Ross's question. But first, Sue, I'd love it if you and Grady found a time to talk between now and two weeks from now, because you are uh, among the, the members on premium 
that I believe is closest to for the first time launching a product. And he's going to be talking about how to get it adopted quickly. So I'd love for it to be a, a live uh, example as opposed to anecdotes about projects in the past, if that's something you guys would be willing to do. I'd absolutely love it. Um, Grady, uh, put my email in the chat and you just send me some times that you want to talk and I'll set up a meeting and we can invite Joe to it. Thank Perfect. You. Perfect. Ross? You know, as the data guy, I guess I, I have to ask a somewhat self-serving question, but, you know, all the risk is based on looking at available data. And instead of getting into the where and how of that, which is my world, you, you last point about debating with the FDA, not arguing, but discussing real risk with the FDA. How do you know that you guys are looking at the same data? How, how do you and guys? For, for Mark's uh, benefit, he does not know what you do. Would you tell us about Basil? Uh, yes, I think QRX does know what we do, but Basal Systems is the regular yeah. quality clinical data. Uh, QRX That's happens to be, yeah, a customer. We're, yeah, we are. <laughs> All right, okay. So, uh, but but my question then is a little more nuanced. What? How do you guys know you're looking at the same data? What? Did... Well, for, well, for sure you do not. Um, this this is the thing that I, that I'll tell people because um, so if I'm at the medical device manufacturer and I'm going to do it in a search in the MOD database, I'm like. How do you not already have all of the data that's in the mod database already? What what new do you think you're going to find there? There's nothing uh, new. You have more data you than they you do. can't find stuff in the mod database at yeah. all because so, it's not available on the interface. Well, and 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 go to TPLC, you know, go to the the Udemed database as that's being created over in Europe. All of these things, again, I would submit to you as the manufacturer, almost always you're going to have more information than they do. Um, so they're not working from the same data that you are. However, they may consider that irrelevant because they think they're looking at all of the high risk data, right? The highest severities, the reportable incidents, all of those types of things they are looking at. But don't forget, you also don't have your competitors' data that they have because they can go inspect those competitors and go get the data. So keep in mind, there's some things on both sides that you may not have that they do. So all of that is, is it comes back to the reason, Ross, I would say, get the best people you can on your risk management teams. The people that have the experience over 20 years of experience or 30 years of experience, that have the clinical experience, that have the use experience, that have the understanding of the manufacturing processes. Because if you can involve those people in the discussion and then have that, again, have that facilitator there to engage them, to ask the questions, to, to do exactly what Joe's been doing on, on the various people that tend to stay silent, pull that information out to the front, the, the questions that, that never get asked, that information that never gets shared. You have to have a facilitator that does that, like Joe has done with all, with all of us and pulling the information out from various people trying to get the engagement. So that's Mark, what I'd um, If I were to just leave this call now uh, and, and not talk with you further, I would think QRXR people I call when I need to assess risk. Is that 80% of your work or is that 20% of your work? That's probably five or 10% of our work. Um, we do a lot of work helping uh, organizations get their technical documentation together. And that's just a piece of the technical documentation. Honestly, what QRX does mostly is quality management system. So the full quality management system, understanding the risk-based approach there, mm -hmm. and then the regulatory submissions. Making are submissions. Are quality management, are you typically paper, virtual, or electronic? Electronic. And do you have someone like, oh, yeah, use Greenlight or use that? Like, do you have a preferred person that you send we, people to? No, we don't. We use uh, many of them, uh, whether it's Grand Avenue, Greenlight, Master Control. We're kind of a little agnostic to that. Um, we we like them all. Uh, each of them have their pluses and minuses. And you, this is where, again, risk-based approach, decide for your organization what your organization needs out of that system. Mm -hmm. Michelle, what's your, when people come to you for quality solutions? Uh, what kind of QMS are you recommending or, or what do you do for them? Um, we provide customized virtual quality management systems. Our customers are um, small enough that financially an electronic quality management system doesn't really make sense for them because of the year over year cost. And also because you still have to have somebody that's an expert in that actual software system. Um, to operate it. So we we host things on like a cloud like box and we have my signature book for signatures that are part 11 compliant. Yep. And then we have this combination of you still work in Word and Excel like you're comfortable with, but 
it's it's virtual and we turn things into PDF. There's no paper. I, and I tell pe people, you got to have a system that you're comfortable with. We can make it work for you. We just we'll put okay. some extra controls around it. I think that's a great uh, thing, Michelle, as, as you're outlining. Don't don't force somebody to get a certain system. You know, right. it, it takes some work to understand those systems. So if, if they've worked with Master Control, if they've worked Grand Avenue, if they've worked with Greenlight, let them do that um, and let them make the choice, not not us forcing them to make a choice. Right. And Mark, to your point, it, different customers, even who want an electronic quality management system, that's not a one size fit all either. And so the person that's going to be comfortable with Grand Avenue is different than the person that's going to be comfortable with Greenlight. And so, yeah, I, I, I avoid trying to strategic partnerships with the electronic software companies. And I don't know if there's anybody on the call that has those things, but I mean, that's just the, 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 you know, the <clears throat> characteristics of the beast out here that, you know, I think that you should use what you're comfortable with. And Chris Kelly to wrap up, do you want to read for the class what you wrote in private on the chat there? Oh, it's a great topic and presentation. This is one of the best I've seen. So, because the, the conversation, everybody's adding more and more to the whole. So, it's been great. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. So, uh, next week we're off. Following week, Grady will talk about uh, adoption of your product. After that, on the 8th, Michelle is going to talk to us about eStar. I uh, haven't identified our December 15th speaker yet. And then we'll be giving you all a break for it. As Christmas always, Joe, Joe year, thank so. you. Yeah, as always, Joe, thank you. And if anybody has any, any questions, I, I assume they can contact you. You can contact me. And Mark is, of course, uh, a yep. premium member, so anyone can just yep. add Mark we'll let, and uh, start that conversation. Yep. Um, for those who celebrate, have a great Thanksgiving, and I'll see you in two weeks. Good conversation. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Mark. Yep. Take, Take care, care, everybody. Happy Thanksgiving.